Thank you so much for joining us. Hello and good evening to those joining from the US. Ohio gozaimasu to our speakers and attendees from Japan. It is our pleasure to welcome you to our event focusing on trilateral relations between Japan, Korea, and the US. A special welcome to the program co-presenter, the Southern Methodist University's Tower Center for Public Policy and International Affairs. In particular, the Sun and Star program on Japan and East Asia. We have over 145 people registered from 21 states and three countries. My name is Paul Pass, and I am the Executive Director of the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. This event is one of many we have presented online since spring of this year, and we are happy that you could join us during both the Japan America Society's 50th anniversary season and the Tower Center's 25th anniversary. Of course, we have all been affected by COVID-19 and we wish everyone safety and health during this uncertain time. In our current global situation, it is essential that we continue to communicate across borders and cultures, as well as within our own communities. We would now like to thank our generous, you see um, a slide on the screen there. We would now like to thank our generous fall 2020 online program sponsors. And as you can see, we have Toyota, American Airlines, MUFG, Mizuho, NEC Corporation of America, SMBC, the City of Plano, Elaine Browning Shainer, Fujitsu America and Fujitsu Network Communications, Hideto Nishitani, the Yamagata Foundation, and John and Christiana Stick. If you are interested in sponsorship, please contact me, Paul Pass, via email at paul.pass, that is P-A-S-S, -S, at jasdfw.org. If you would like to contribute at a lower amount, we also welcome your donations to support the Japan America Society and its programming. In a few moments, as you can see now, actually, we have a QR code. And in order to access the link, you just need to open your phone's picture app and hold it over the QR code for a few seconds. Then it will link to our online giving portal. If you do not have a smartphone, or you are using your phone now to watch the program, we will share a link in the chat box. We have seen donations of $10 for similar events, but no gift is too small. Lastly, I wanted to go over some suggestions to maximize your experience. Please note that your cameras and microphones are off. If there are any technical issues, such as you are unable to hear the presenters, then please use the chat function, and it should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the event for the presenters, please use the Q&A function also on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask questions early since we may, may not be able to address all of these questions during the program. We also request that you include your name and location, such as Dallas or Tokyo, within your question. Please also note that this webinar will be recorded and we plan to upload to YouTube soon. Now to support the program is our longtime friend and moderator, Hiroki Takauchi. He is an assistant professor at SMU's Tower Center and director of the center's Sun and Star program on Japan and East Asia. Hiroki, please feel free to begin the program. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Hiroki Takeuchi, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of Sound Star Program on Japan and East Asia in the SMU Tower Center. Before beginning today's program, I'd like to uh, mention um, a thanks, appreciation to uh, the Japan America Society Dallas Sport Wars team led by Paul Pass, uh, as well as Madoka and Ryan. Ryan. Uh, also, uh, I appreciate uh, the uh, help uh, for organizing this event. Uh, I appreciate, uh, I thank uh, Bora Razzi of the SMU Tower Center. Uh, finally, but not least uh, importantly, uh, I appreciate the uh, co-sponsorship of the Japan Airlines for supporting the programs of SMU Tower Center and SMU in Japan program at the Tansei Gakuin University. Today, we are going to talk about uh, Japan-Korea-US trilateral relations. Japan and South Korea are the two most important allies of the United States, especially in East Asia and Asia Pacific. However, Japan and Korea bilateral relations are often rocky 
uh, due to the, uh, due to the domestic politics of those two countries. So to discuss current state of Japan, Korea, US trilateral relations, uh, we fortunately we have the best speakers I can think of, uh, two spe best two speakers I can think of. We first talk about the each country's domestic politics, domestic politics of Japan and South Korea. And then we move to the discussion to uh, examine uh, how domestic politics of Japan and South Korea influences bilateral relations between Japan and South Korea. And then uh, we talk about how Japan-Korea bilateral relations influence US geopolitical and geoeconomic strategy toward the Asia Pacific. We have two great speakers. One is the first speaker is Professor Yasuo Sakata, uh, pro uh, professor of international relations at Kan uh, Kanda University of International Studies. She is the leading scholar of Korea on uh, Korea and international relations uh, in Japan. The second speaker is Mr. Mark Napper. Uh, he is the deputy assistant secretary of state for Korea and Japan. And he is, I would say, the best person to talk about Japan, Korea, US trilateral relations uh, from the United States. And the one more thing I would like to add is uh, I have a tremendous respect to the officials of the State Department, uh, especially under the current tumultuous uh, time. Uh, and then they are the people who are preventing US foreign policy from unraveling, I would say. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm very pleased uh, with having these two uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, we first start with um, Professor Satata, Satata-sensei. Thank you. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, good morning from Tokyo and evening to you. Um, it is a uh, pleasure to join this webinar hosted by the Distinguished Japan America Society. And it is a pleasure to meet the guests uh, across the ocean and, and so forth online. Um, my thanks also goes to the uh, um, organizers, Paul San and his staff, and Professor Takeuchi uh, as a great moderator and academic, and uh, Mark Napperson, uh, whom I respect for being such a uh, professional diplomat that he is. Um, managing Japan and South Korea relations can be a big headache sometimes. Um, so thank you for, for the sake of all of us. Um, just one personal note, um, I did, I grew up in Chicago, so that's where my English is coming from. Um, my father was also, uh, was a uh, shoshama, uh, trading company guy person, um, and I lived uh, with my family there. He was actually also in Houston, um, not Dallas, but, you know, close enough. And so I, it's really wonderful to be, um, be able to uh, jo uh, join the, uh, uh, this uh, session today. Um, so now turning to the uh, theme of this um, webinar, uh, I've been asked to make comments um, from, on um, well, Japan-South Korea um, bilateral relations. Um, but before I do so, I would like to make one brief comment about the strategic importance of the US-Japan-Korea or South Korea um, ROK, Republic of Korea trilateral relationship. Um, the trilateral relationship is um, a strategic anchor. Um, it's like an Achilles heel, so to speak, that is critical to maintaining um, peace and security in Northeast Asia and on the broader Indo-Pacific. Um, but defense cooperation unfortunately faced a crisis last year in November um, over the, the so-called G-Samia issue, the uh, Japan-Korea uh, military information sharing agreement. But thankfully, uh, thankfully, it was saved uh, with strong intervention. Thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, the, yes, so the trilateral is important, but like an Achilles heel, um, you only notice it when it's damaged. And when it damaged, when it's damaged, it damaged, it really hurts. <laughs> so like any other relationship, ideally, we should be constantly keeping watch, um, you know, like bonsai, you know, trim and add. Um, but as the uh, security environment rapidly evolves with the U.S.-China strategic competition, the two alliances, the U.S.-Japan and U.S.-Korea, 
as well as Japan, Korea needs to be updated. So now turning to um, Japan, Korea relations, I'd like to provide my view on the current state of um, the relationship in two aspects. Um, first, a little bit about society and public opinion, then about the dire situation in the political diplomatic arena. So I'd like to share one slide um, with you uh, from a Japan-Korea joint opinion poll done by Geno and PO and East Asia Institute. Could you? Yes, thank you. And it's a famous independent survey um, focused on Japan, Korea, uh, conducted annually um, since 2013. And I wanted to show you this um, to give you some context about the entirety of the relationship, you know, not just politics and diplomacy. Um, yes, they say that Japan, Korea relations are at an all time low since 1965 when the two countries normalized relations, which is very true but partly true. Um, despite the politics, the culture and society relations, while facing challenges, continue to grow and you know, must still show some resilience. Um, we had the 55th anniversary of the normalization um, this year, you know, not, not much fanfare uh, officially, but there was the Korea-Japan festival held every year, and it was for the first time held online. Um, and then, well, there's this fourth K-pop or Hallyu boom, um, Hallyu wave in Japan with Netflix dramas and bestseller novels and, you know, the born in 1982 Kim Jong and, and also the recently a joint project by Sony and JYP Entertainment, the big um, K-pop company um, called, uh, the, the uh, project is called Niji, Rainbow Bridge, um, with the girls, um, ja all Japanese girls um, pop group just debuted this summer. I mean, and aired on Hulu TV and all that. And so, you know, the popular culture is still going on. But politics do affect the mood in society. So if you look at this graph, um, uh, it's, been, it's been taking from 2013 to onward and it's done annually. So it's a cumulative um, survey of uh, um, Japan Korea relations. But this one is, it asks if Japan Korea, um, are we important to each other? And um, first point is that um, there is more support for bilateral relations compared to those that say no. So on the bottom is the negative and the, and the top part is the, uh, the positive. But as you can see on the Japanese side, you can see a downward trend from 70% in 2013 to 50%, you know, yes. Yeah. So it's a 20% drop, which is uh, a big drop in a span of six to seven years, due mainly to the um, the history issue. Um, but on the contrary, you can see the Korean opinion moving up from 70 to like 80%. So, you know, that was, it was a good trend. But this poll was conducted in June 29. Um, but right after this in July, the export control issue arose and, and really soured Korean um, public opinion toward Japan with the boycott of Japanese good and law. So very unfortunately, bad um, politics do um, sometimes sour public opinion on both sides. Now, uh, on the political and diplomatic front, um, once again, unfortunately, the relationship is at an all-time low. And, um, you know, Korea and Japan are at a diplomatic impasse. We are stuck in what can be called negative issue linkage politics. Um, so, you know, what are the issues? Um, they are, work, uh, if you can um, turn off the, uh, uh, the uh, um, graph, thank you. So um, what are the issues? Wartime laborers, export control, and GSAMIA. So there's three issues here, but actually it is two issues, um, really. Um, since GSAMIA uh, the, uh, was, um, has been essentially put off the table thanks to US intervention. But of course, it's not totally off, but it's, it's essentially off. So the core issue um, among them is the most difficult issue is the Korean wartime laborers. It is a legal issue that involves history, human rights, and a lot of emotion. So in October 2018, the Korean Supreme Court ruled that Japanese companies have an obligation to pay compensation to the, uh, the victims, the plaintiffs. But the Japanese government claims that it is a violation which goes beyond the, um, the 1965 agreement um, in which all claims were settled. Um, 
So the ROK government is kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place where they have to respect the 1965 agreement, but at the same time, they also have to um, respect the domestic Supreme Court ruling. So um, they're kind of stuck there. But then in July 29th, uh, 2019, uh, the history issue further spilled over into the economy when the Japanese government suddenly strengthened ex export control uh, restrictions vis-a-vis -vis South Korea. Um, I mean, of course, it does have a security logic of its own, but it also is um, taken as a political countermeasure. And then after that, in, uh, furthermore, in August, this spilled over into military security when the ROK um, government, Blue House, suddenly announced its intent to terminate USAMIA. Well, that's when I think Americans got angry <laughs> and the U.S. intervened to save the agreement in November. So lastly, um, so now we are in 2020 and Korea and Japan did resume dialogue after that, after the G-Samia crisis, but we are stuck again. Um, Prime Minister Abe and Pri President Moon met in December last year, and I'd like to note that um, in a policy speech in the Diet in January of this year, Prime Minister Abe reinstated the keywords for um, Korea-Japan relations um, that, that had disappeared for a few years. What are those keywords? Um, that South Korea is, number one, the most important neighbor, shares basic values and strategic interests, and we want to build a future-oriented relationship. So those key words have been reinstated, so it was an okay start for the, for the year. Um, and there was actually some progress in export control, but talks unfortunately stopped in May. And in the meantime, the labor's issue, uh, the most difficult issue is ticking, like a time bomb. At a, faster, at a faster pace since August. So if we let it be, uh, the legal process that is, um, we could actually see a diplomatic co collision if the Japanese company's um, business assets are actually um, being liquidated. So will the change of leadership in Japan from um, Prime Minister Abe to Prime Minister Suga uh, recently uh, become an opportunity to reset Korea-Japan relations? Um, that, the uh, diagnosis so far is not so bright, but um, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And that's uh, Prime Minister Suga's motto. Um, so if, if both leaders are willing and, and provided the political space, uh, there might be some leeway for flexibility, but um, we're in a very uh, tough situation right now. So uh, this autumn will be another busy season for diplomacy. I will end my comments here. Thank you. Thank you, Sakata-san. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Mark Napper. Mark. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and let me echo Sakata-sensei's expression of gratitude to the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, to SMU's Tower Center. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Takeuchi-sensei. This is really, uh, it's an honor to be here this evening, our time, but good morning to our friends in Japan. Um, you know, I, I, every, every occasion I get to do these events, I always uh, have to say how, how much a pity it is that we have to do this online and not in person. Um, I miss uh, being able to do it and seeing folks uh, live and, and together. So hopefully yes, very soon we'll be able to return to, to those, those days. But uh, thank you everyone for joining this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, <laughs> which is uh, the relationship uh, between and among the U.S., Japan, and the Republic of Korea. Uh, we just had a really excellent overview of the recent diplomatic and, and other history between Japan and South Korea, so I won't belabor that, but maybe I thought I'd start um, by exploring just a little bit um, something that Takeuchi Sensei said when he started, talking about how the U.S. relationships between Japan and the Republic of Korea are really among the most important relationships the U.S enjoys, and I would say really anywhere in the world. Um, and why is this? We always say this, but, but what, why do we say it? And I think it comes down to, to a number of things, but I think first of all, let's look at, uh, first and foremost, these relationships with both countries, Japan and South Korea, are, are ultimately security alliances. Uh, they emerged from very different circumstances. Of course, our security alliance with Japan uh, evolved after the end of World War II as we were confronting the Soviet Union and the spread of international communism. Um, and the, the, the alliance with South Korea, of course, emerged on the battlefield in 1950 uh, after the, the invasion of South Korea by North Korea. But what were essentially two military 
relationships have evolved over the past several decades into something much more. And these are, these are two alliances, two friendships that encompass virtually every aspect of, of, of human endeavor that you can think of, whether it's, it's trade, whether it's investment, whether it's science and technology cooperation, um, health cooperation, such as what we're seeing uh, to fight the COVID virus. Uh, it's it's people to people contact. It's all the the young Koreans and Japanese that study in the U.S. and and vice versa, and so on. So these are these are really vital um, relationships that the U.S. has with both South Korea and Japan. Um, I mean, if you just think about in in the state of Texas alone, uh, Samsung Electronics has a major uh, semiconductor factory in the Austin area, which employs over ten thousand people. Of course, uh, in Texas uh, as well. I mean, Japanese firms. Too many to name, but Toyota is huge, and, and many others, many of the sponsors for whom we have this uh, this series of events to thank, uh, our, our major presence in, in Texas, and and these uh, these investment relationships uh, are so important for the United States, for our economy, for our prosperity. They create jobs, good jobs for for American workers and their families, and so really, these alliances, these friendships, go so far beyond their their origins back back in the in the 40s and 50s. Uh, so they're important. That's the bottom line. Um, so then why do we, you know, if we've got such strong relations with Japan, if we have such strong relations with Korea, uh, you know, why should the U.S. care whether Japan and South Korea get along? If we ourselves are enjoying such good relations, then does it really matter if Japan and South Korea uh, don't get along? And, and I would say it absolutely matters. And it, it matters to the United States for a number of reasons. Um, and one is, and we already heard from, from Sakata Sensei, it's the very practical matter of our day-to-day -day military cooperation. It's the practical matter of how our three countries can, can work together in a crisis. And this comes down to, as, as, as she described, we have uh, this agreement known as GISOMIA, which is, uh, stands for the General Security of Military Information Agreement, which is a way that countries can agree to share real-time intelligence, real-time information about military activities, particularly in a crisis. And so uh, we have Jisomias, the United States, with many other countries around the world. We have one with South Korea, we have one with Japan. And uh, several years ago, Japan and South Korea um, signed their own Jisomia. And, and this is important because if you think about the kind of crisis that, can, that has happened um, in Northeast Asia that it would impact all of us, say a North Korean nuclear test, a North Korean uh, missile launch, and these things are happening very quickly. Split second decisions are needed. And to facilitate that, we need to be able to share information, uh, whether it's what a South Korean radar is able to detect, what something a Japanese radar is able to detect, something an American satellite is able to detect. That unless we can share that info quickly and in real time, um, it's very hard to, for our decision makers to, to respond effectively, particularly if it's, God forbid, you know, more than just a test. Uh, so when, when the Republic of Korea uh, announced that it was suspending its agreement, or terminating its, I'm sorry, its GISOMIA with, with Japan, uh, the United States, of course, uh, uh, reacted uh, publicly. And this was a big deal uh, because up until, up until that point, we had, we had taken a very uh, principled position that we were not going to take sides uh, in any kind of dispute between Japan and South Korea. We were not going to uh, uh, mediate or intervene in any way. But with the announcement about this termination of GISOMIA, that's when uh, we concluded that it was going to really, this was going to negatively impact our interests. And so we did um, express our views quite strongly and publicly, but at the same time, I think behind the scenes, we were definitely uh, working with both sides to try and find a way forward. And thankfully, um, you know, Korea made the decision to what they call uh, suspend its termination of the agreement, which is at least putting it on, which means, you know, putting it on ice for now, which is, which is a good thing. So, so from a very practical point of view, um, strong, good, everyday relations between Japan and Korea really do benefit the United States. But I would say when you look at sort of the bigger picture, when you look at more broadly what's going on regionally, and when you're looking at the challenge posed by, by the People's Republic of China, this is where I think productive and constructive relations between Japan and Korea really do matter. Because when you look at these two countries, the United States, 
you know, we share more than just interests. We share more than just concerns about, about what's going on in North Korea, what's going on in China. We share values. And these, these are very precious values of, of uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, values related to how countries uh, should act towards one another in ways that aren't coercive. We, we share values about the importance of rule of law. These are all things that are under threat right now uh, by the uh, leadership of the, the Chinese Communist Party. And so unless the United States, Japan, and South Korea can really band together and, and based on our, the foundation of our shared values, of our shared principles, uh, to, to uphold uh, these very precious values that are under threat in the region, frankly, in many parts of the world, uh, then we, we stand the, the, the threat of losing them. And so I think more than ever, um, United States, South Korea, and Japan need to find a way to cooperate, uh, and, and especially Japan and Korea. I think uh, dealing with the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, the pandemic, is, is a perfect opportunity for the U.S., Japan, and Korea to work together. I think given the very advanced uh, state of our medical communities in each country of our public health experts. Uh, we, we've got, you know, the most advanced uh, medical systems in the world in our three countries. And so naturally, it would make sense for us to, to work together cooperatively to, to find either a vaccine or, or treatments for, for COVID. And that's, that's one way we can, we can hopefully work together and send a message to our peoples, to our media, to our elected representatives, just about how important working together, these three democracies, these three, these three countries that share values, uh, three countries that love baseball. I mean, this is a really important, uh, a really important aspect of our, of our, <laughs> our three countries shared, shared interests. And so, um, you know, the United States, again, just because we, we say we're not going to intervene or, or mediate, it doesn't mean we're not interested. Uh, when we say we don't take sides, it doesn't mean we don't care, we do. And very often the efforts we, we do undertake are are not visible to the media or to the public eye, but, but we do work hard every day to, to do our best to play a convener, to bring our three countries together, to find ways to, to improve all of our relations so that constructively and productively we can work together for the betterment, not just of our own peoples, uh, but for the betterment of others that are in the region and around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, uh, if you have any question or comments, something that you want to discuss, please uh, write it in uh, the Q and A uh, section. Um, so uh, I will uh, try my best to uh, take as many questions as possible. Uh, sometimes I may uh, combine some of the questions uh, if the questions are related to each other. Um, so uh, one thing that I'd like to ask a question to uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to kick off the discussion is, uh, um, could you talk a little bit more about uh, North Korea? So uh, obviously uh, North Korea is a uh, uh, significant uh, player. Um, and um, so uh, Mark talked a little bit about uh, um, the importance of the uh, trilateral relations um, for especially uh, Korea, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, bilateral relations uh, to for United States to confront uh, North Korean issue. Um, so, um, Satata-san, uh, so could you talk a little bit more about like uh, you know it seems that uh, Japan and South Korea both share the interests uh, to cooperate with each other to uh, face North Korea. Uh, and then, but you know, uh, the reality is that there are so many problems uh, to cooperate uh, to um, solve the various problems related to uh, North, Korea, uh, North Korea. So uh, why, like, you know, does like a cooperation? Why is cooperate, cooperation uh, between Japan and South Korea so difficult? Um, and then, Mark, uh, could you kind of reiterate the importance of uh, 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 you know of being uh, of the Japan South Korea? at the same side, uh, and then at the same side with the United States uh, to uh, confront uh, the North Korean uh, issue. So, uh, Satata-san. Hey, thank you. Um, on North Korea uh, and why Japan and Korea cannot co 
incorporate as much as we can. Um, actually, when I what I hear from diplomats uh, in in Tokyo and all is um, on North Korea security issues, the the trilateral you know, the diplomats um, do get together, and it's one of the areas that they, they are able to cooperate. Um, so that's one one uh, fact for you. <laughs> um, uh, but um, there's many facets of um, um, aspects of cooperation on North Korea, and um, there's, um, one, one is deterrence, uh, the military aspect, uh, deterrence and defense. Two is the, um, the diplomacy or the, uh, the sanctions uh, in the United Nations Security Council and all, and all that, the uh, sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. And the third dimension is um, diplomacy. Um, U.S. North Korea diplomacy, you know, Japan North Korea, South uh, North and South Korea, and so forth. Diplomacy aspect. So when I when you say uh, Japan and Korea, U.S. you know, cooper, um, cooperating on North Korea, you have to kind of differentiate um, on what aspect we're talking about. And so on defense cooperation, um, um, despite the Jisanya uh, crisis, at the working oh, at the how do you say people on the ground, so to speak. Um, defense and also intelligence people um, do I, I hear that are are, um, are on a like a, a, a working um, how do you say a, a, on a good level uh, of cooperation um, when it's necessary they get together uh, crisis crisis response but perhaps Mark can fill fill, fill us up uh, fill um uh, fill in more on that um, on the sanctions. Um, of course, Japan is all more leaning towards sanctions vis-a-vis um, -vis dipl diplomacy. But um, Japan has never uh, said we have um, closed the door to diplomacy. And um, we have been um, supporting you know, the US-North Korea talks uh, in, in the background. Um, it might not be as um, forthcoming as what the, uh, uh, the Moon government wants. <laughs> but we are playing our, our own roles, you know, like, it's not good cop, bad cop, but you know, tough cop and soft cop, so to speak. So, but there are differences. Um, and, on, and on diplomacy, um, of course, South Korea is more forthcoming and want to, um, how do you say, uh, proceed and, and, and engage North Korea uh, more for its own interest. And Japan, once again, um, we have uh, kept our doors open. Um, Prime Minister Abe um, has said we will, he will talk with Mr. Kim Jong-un under without condition without precondition so to speak um, and I think Suga-san um, if I may continue with one last comment is that um, I think Prime Minister Suga uh, is continues continuing on that line um, he has said that and also he has a personal interest as well on the abductees issue um, as well as North and North Korean nuclear missile issue but um, um, so you know we'll see what happens but um, right now, I think diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea is in a difficult situation. Um, so we'll see what happens with the uh, Mr. Trump and uh, or uh, the U.S. and North Korea. Yes, I'll end my comments there. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Well, I think uh, you know Sakata Sensei uh, nailed it. She she really covered the the three major aspects of cooperation vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. I think Sakata Sensei, the word you were looking for was. Uh, operational, sort of at the ah, operational yes. level. I, uh, you know, we've got excellent relations among uh, the defense communities in each of our countries. Um, but I think when we look at North Korea, and, and I can speak about just where, where the United States is right now, uh, we go back to the, um, the June 2018 uh, Singapore summit uh, that we had between uh, President Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un. Uh, within that, I mean, there was a document that was, that was signed by, by both both men and enshrined within are some very basic goals that the U.S. has towards the Korean Peninsula. One, of course, is uh, what we call transformation of the U.S.-North Korea relationship, um, which basically, I mean, that that's, that's refers to denuclearization, essentially uh, addressing the North Korean nuclear and missile programs so that they are no longer a threat either to North Korea's neighbors or to the United States or anyone else. Um, and a second uh, goal enshrined in this this joint statement was uh, that of bringing peace to the the Korean Peninsula and, and and improving relations between North and South Korea. So, so there's these two these twin goals of denuclearization, improved relations with the U.S. and improved relations between North and South Korea. Clearly, 
Uh, we can't go it alone. Um, we need to work very closely with South Korea on this. And we need to work very closely with other regional partners um, like Japan, um, like China, frankly. And even though uh, things, things with, with China uh, are often difficult or very difficult in many ways, given their, their very uh, aggressive and provocative behavior and, and threat to, to the, the principles we hold dear. I mean, there are, you know, pra pragmatically speaking, there are areas in which uh, we are inter interest to align. And one of them is, is uh, maintaining stability in the region and addressing uh, peacefully uh, North Korea's nuclear and, and missile programs. And so um, just like Japan, the, the door to diplomacy, uh, the door uh, is, is open. Uh, we, we regularly state publicly that uh, we want to, to have a diplomatic resolution with, with North Korea to uh, the issues of international concern. Um, but until, until then though, we will continue to uh, implement the UN Security Council sanctions regime. And to that end, we cooperate very closely with Japan, with South Korea, with others in the international community to, uh, to, keep, the, uh, to keep the pressure on. But, but ultimately, it's our sincere hope that we can find a peaceful solution to, uh, to the North Korean um, nuclear missile programs. Thanks. Uh, um, uh, Sakata-san, yes. If I, if I yeah, may, sure. just one more comment. Um, Regarding a uh, Korea-Japan uh, um, cooperation vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, the intelligence area, um, uh, we talked about Jisamia, but um, at the personal level, personnel level, um, Mr. Sohong, uh, who is uh, formerly uh, the, um, NS, uh, the National Security um, Information um, person, uh, now um, NSC, head of NSC, um, he, has, he was one of the um, personal, how do you say, envoys to, um, how do you say, share information with Japan as well, uh, especially during the 2017, 2018 crisis, uh, 2017 crisis um, and 2018 as well. And now um, in, in Japan's NSC, um, it was, uh, the first um, head was uh, Mr. Yachi, the, 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 the diplomat. And now it's uh, Mr. Kitamura, who is um, uh, from NSB, the uh, National uh, Police Agency, sorry, who is, um, um, how do you say, adept at the, uh, the intelligence um, gathering on North Korea domestically. And so I think that uh, Mr. Um, so what is talked about here is that um, Despite all the Korea-Japan diplomatic impasse uh, at the um, how do you say the operational level, as uh, Mark said, um, Kitamura-san and Sohu-san probably um, have a good relationship, um, perhaps, and to share um, um, intel on North Korea as well. I'll just add that. Thank you. Two people are asking the question about the uh, K-pop uh, culture, uh, K-pop culture, anime, and. Uh, slightly different angles, but uh, so one is uh, from uh, Ferris Adams, uh, my former student, uh, says uh, it seems that the Japan and Korea have an enormous impact on American culture uh, by like uh, K-pop or anime, whereas uh, China does not. Uh, and then, so his question is uh, why not, why uh, by Japan, not uh, Korea, but uh, not by China? Is it because China is also Italian country? Um, and then another question from Erin Messick uh, said, asks, um, why, like, you know, if like, uh, Korea and Japan have a lot of problems and then their relationship is so bad, and then, um, you know, their public uh, image uh, is uh, uh, deteriorating, right? So then, like, uh, why, like, uh, is, uh, like, a K-pop culture still popular, uh, right? So, uh, um, so how do you think about the impact of, uh, on the significance of cultural interactions, especially K-pop, anime, um, and other things? Um, how do you think? Uh, Sakata-san, do you want to answer this question? Okay. Um, first of all, um, I am not a uh, pop culture expert. Um, so it's just my um, personal view um, looking at the relationship. Um, uh, so the question was, so why, why is um, K-pop so popular in Japan is, the, I guess, one, one of the questions. Um, if, uh, politics doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> they just enjoy it. And I think the, the world of SNS uh, really changed the relationship. Um, for, for some 
for good and for the bad. Um, for good is that these these kids, these children, uh, these kids can these young people can share um, culture, pop culture, you know, without um, just instantly, right? Um, share the music, you know, just click it. Apple is right there, <laughs> and um, so there's much more um, intimate, how do you say, close um, and um, quick, uh, how do you say, uh, a sharing of um, culture uh, more than before. But at the same time, um, SNS also uh, is is a platform for um, how do you say hate Japan or hate Korea <laughs> um, discourse. So that's uh, another. Um, uh, headache for, uh, for the relationship. But uh, once again, um, people like what, it, what they like. And even in my universities, there's K-pop dance circles. And, and Japanese students really, how do you say, um, who care about um, Korea-Japan relations are um, at a bind, you know? Um, they want to do more things together. And, but they, don't, they, can't, they can't understand the uh, politics and the history very well. So, yeah, that's number one. Uh, uh, and should I ask you the question about the China China influence? Uh, okay. Well, China pop. Um, well, I don't have. A, once again, I'm not an expert, but you know, there's Bruce Lee and the Hong Kong movies and all that. And the China, um, how do you say, a pop uh, Taiwan as well. <laughs> the Chinese um, culture influence, I think, is is there. Okay. Um, so that's my um, uh, my uh, how do you say, amateur <laughs> opinion on this topic. Mark, do you have any comment about the uh, um, impacts of K-pop culture on trilateral relations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll just make a couple of points. And in fact, before the broadcast, we were talking about this a little bit amongst ourselves. But I mean, there is actually a, a very, very rich history of, of cultural exchanges between uh, Japan and, and Korea dating back to uh, the 17th century, uh, dating back to in the aftermath of a really terrible conflict um, on the Korean Peninsula in 1597. Sorry to, to, to go too far back in history, but it was a, a war between Japan and, and the then uh, Kingdom of Chosun. And, and uh, once that war ended, barely six, seven years later, there was a renewal of, of cultural contact between the two. Korea was sending these envoys um, to Japan every, every few years. And obviously it's a long journey, they have to go by boat and then by horse. Uh, it took many months, but um, but these envoys, travelers from Korea, would bring the latest in in pottery and the latest in poetry styles and the latest in painting styles. And these were taken up in Japan and very popular. But it was a very rich 200, 250 year uh, process of, of cultural exchange between the two. And so. I think what we're seeing now is just a, a continuation in some way, whether it, instead of boats and horses now, uh, as Sakata Sensei said, it's SNS and, and more instantaneous communication. But it, I think it does show that they're at a very fundamental level. I think there is a very rich history of cultural exchanges and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, uh, I think a strong uh, you know, foundation for, for future growth between the two countries. And, and I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, I always try to be optimistic. I think uh, these two countries have more bringing them together than pulling them apart. And so even though things are tough right now, I'm confident that things will, will get better in the future. As for, as for China, I mean, I, I'm not an expert either, but I do think um, when we talk about things like K-pop and we talk about J-pop and, and other cultural influence, it really does get to this issue of soft power. And I think within international relations, when we talk about foreign policy, Soft power is, is not given the credit it's due when it comes to the influence countries enjoy um, in their neighborhood or around the world. And this is something, of course, the United States took great advantage of after World War II in terms of American pop culture, whether it was movies or music. Um, you know, think of, think of uh, you know, Elvis Presley, think of, of uh, you know, the movies we made of John Wayne. Um, and this is, this is what we're seeing now with, with South Korea um, and to a lesser extent, Japan. These are soft power, um, these are soft power superpowers in a way, especially Korea. And so I think um, if a country and a government can skillfully take advantage of, of these soft power tools, it really does have a, a very outsized impact on the, um, the ability of a country to uh, succeed internationally and, and build its trade relationships and investment relationships and really to strengthen its its role either within its own region or, or globally. Uh, uh, yeah. 
If I may add just one quick, uh, quick one. Um, after, um, first of all, I second what the Mark said about the soft power area. Um, for those who are studying international relations, um, yes, we need to um, study both the hard power aspect and the soft power aspect of the U.S.-Korea-Japan relationship. <laughs> but the, the, the comment I wanted to add was, um, why is uh, uh, Korean culture, uh, pop culture, um, popular in Japan. And yes, there's a, uh, thousands of years of cultural affinity from starting from Buddhism, but there's also um, uh, uh, but there's also contemporary issues as democratic societies. You know, we share a lot of um, the woes of uh, uh, mature, advanced democracies. And also, uh, one issue in that is um, the, the role of women, gender. And there's a lot of um, civic society um, discussions going on between Japan and Korea. And one phenomenon of that is um, uh, maybe some of you know the Born in 1982 Kim Ji Young. Um, it's it's a book and it's going to be a movie. It's a movie, right? And this was also this was translated. A lot of the um, female authored Korean novels are translated into in ja into Japanese and become bestsellers because um, Japanese women want to read it, you know. So there's this, there's this connection as mature advanced societies, democratic societies, um, thinking about gender issues and so forth. I, Thank you. Now I'm gonna jump in <laughs> and build upon something Sakata Sensei just said. I mean, if, while we're talking about shared issues between and among mature democracies, mature societies, I think um, another issue for sure that there's room for cooperation is, is the demographic one and how do we deal with aging societies in all of our countries. I mean, the problem, of course, isn't as acute in the United States as it is in Japan and Korea, but these are two countries uh, that uh, are aging uh, rapidly, that aren't having as many children as they used to, that don't enjoy significant uh, immigration inflows. And so how do you, uh, everything from high-tech solutions to aging, with, you know, so robotics, for example, to, to help uh, folks who can't get around as easily, to automated uh, vehicle, autonomous vehicles, uh, to social safety net matters. How do you, you know, as a government, what do we, you know, how do we take care of our elderly or folks who are living on their own at an advanced age? And so, this is absolutely an area of, of cooperation, I think, uh, between uh, between Japan and South Korea. Okay, um, I'd like to uh, ask a different question, and then it's a little bit tough one. Um, so, uh, I'd like to combine two questions. Uh, so. Uh, so one question comes from uh, my student, uh, Abby Herrera, uh, asking about comfort women issue. Uh, and then um, I'd like to frame this as, uh, so, uh, so Sakata-san talked about like, uh, uh, you know, Gisomia and then like uh, uh, before that whitelist uh, export control issue. And then like uh, that's what is originated with the uh, uh, forced labor uh, issue, right? Uh, so and then like an issue linkage happened. So uh, uh, we, she, uh, you talked about this, uh, but uh, you know, neither of you uh, talked about comfort women issue. So now it's it's not the main issue anymore, or still it's a, a significantly big issue. And the other question uh, is coming from Sam Shijo, uh, who is a new uh, honorary consul general of Japan in Dallas Fort Worth. Uh, he asked, uh, uh, it seems like uh, the war forced labor issue is uh, very difficult to be solved. So, uh, so can it be solved? Uh, I think that both conformed women issue and also forced labor issue are both very difficult to be solved. Uh, so uh, could you talk about these two issues and then how important they are? And, uh, and then do you think of any solution? Um, Satata-san, do you want to start? Um, okay, number one, the comfort women issue. Yes, um, uh, that um, for, that 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 is um, how do you say? It? Uh, right now, it's not part of the issue linkage politics game um, for good or for bad. Um, but um, I think the Japanese government and Prime Minister Abe and the government. Um, was very, um, how do you say, disappointed at how the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement was um, treated. And it's still effective, but it's not. <laughs> so, you know, 
uh, we were hoping that that could be a, a platform where for Japan and Korea to work on together toward reconciliation and healing of the comfort women that did accept um, uh, for their, you know, for their own reasons, uh, you know, all the, the, uh, the uh, efforts that was done. So number one, there's this, um, oh, we're so disappointed um, because, of the, because of how the 2015 agreement was treated by the um, Moon government. So I hope that there could be some reevaluation um, regarding that so we can work together on how to, um, how to embrace this issue. Um, of course, there was the Asian Women's Fund from before where we uh, where we uh, where Japan tried to address and there's a good you know digital website um, explaining the hardships of the stories of the uh, the comfort women the women that um, uh, the military brothels you know that had to work there and so you know Japan had had done its share and was trying to reach out to the Korean people but the politics um, unfortunately um, uh, becomes obstacles toward real reconciliation. But there are academics um, that are trying to work on this. Um, so I'll end it there. And oh, by the way, Mr. Suga, the Prime Minister Suga also worked uh, really hard, I think, behind the scenes toward the 2015 Comfort Women Agreements. So I think he has his personal, I guess, grudges <laughs> regarding how the issue was um, treated, uh, at, uh, treated how, how the 2015 agreement was treated. Um, and the second question was the, uh, the how the forced labor, the, the uh, sorry, the uh, laborers, the wartime laborers um, issue can be solved. Um, well, that's a big issue. But um, if I may share just one um, uh, s slide, can you sh can the staff share what the slide again? Um, there's this. Um, it's possible. Second, third, fourth. It's the it's the sixth slide. Um, Thank you, Paul. It's the uh, sixth slide. Yeah, this is from if you. This is from the Geno NPO um, East Asia. Uh, the uh, the next one, yes. Uh, the sixth slide. Thank you. Okay, it's very small, but you can check the. Um, you can Google the Geno NPO um, South Korea Japan Joint Public Opinion Poll, and. They ask um, what should be done to resolve the wartime laborers issue, and there's several, you know, ideas. Um, one is that the Korean government should compensate, compensate for the former wartime laborers, um, and um, based on the 1965 agreement, um, uh, because all, you know, claims are settled, and so the Korean government should take care of. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is uh, Japan, the Japanese firm should compensate in accordance with the Korean Supreme Court ruling. That's the, the Korean side of the argument, um, the Supreme Court argument. And then number, but that's not acceptable to the Japanese side, um, the Japanese government, right? And then, um, but uh, let's see, yes. Um, Oh, yes, number uh, one. One idea that was explored is is the fourth one, which is the the Korean government should initiate establishing a foundation to compensate um, former laborers and their families with voluntary co um, contribution from Japanese and Korean firms. This was actually um, um, discussed uh, in twenty eighteen. Uh, sorry, 2019, um, but it's uh, it stopped. So we'll see what happens. But this is one of the um, ideas that um, the Japanese government, uh, the Japanese side, could work with. That was the that was the discussion last year, but it stopped. So we'll see what happens with this idea. So I'll just end it there. Thank you. Mark, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, look, I wish I wish we had a a magic solution to these very very thorny issues. Um, I mean, the comfort woman issue, even though maybe it's not discussed as much anymore as it used to be. You know, we, we you know we've said publicly that this is uh, this was a, an atrocious, egregious human rights violation, um, and that uh, you know we sincerely hope that there's some way um, going forward for for Japan and South Korea to to deal with this issue, to deal with other issues, forced labor, in a way that promotes healing, that promotes reconciliation, uh, and in a way that's satisfactory to both countries. 
but at the same time, hopefully, uh, paves the way to, to a relationship that's oriented towards the future, towards a relationship that, again, is productive, is constructive, and, and serves, serves the interests of, of all of us together um, as democracies. Uh, but the United States, I mean, we, the government, we, we get it. We understand that these are extremely sensitive issues. Um, you know, the United States is not, um, not immune from, from dealing with history issues, certainly. Uh, we've, we have our share that we're still wrestling with. Um, and so I think, you know, being naive for, for, for us to say, oh, why don't, you know, they should just get over it. Uh, we, you know, they can't, I mean, we, we understand that too. It's not something you, one just gets over. And, and so we will support both sides as they wrestle with these, these delicate thorny issues. But again, hopefully in a way that does promote reconciliation and then at the same time um, builds a, a more future oriented uh, you know, relationship uh, between the two. Okay, uh, we are uh, coming, toward, uh, coming toward the end of the discussion, but this discussion is so great that, so I, we may go a little bit over time, but I would like to give you maybe the last question that is actually a very big question because I'm combining a few big questions. Um, so uh, a few people um, uh, raised the uh, China factor. Um, so Yamaguchi-san of Sumitomo Shoji Houston office, asks like, uh, how about, you know, could you include China into the picture, right? Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the uh, Stephen Rav, um, our uh, Tower, Center uh, Tower Center Forum member asks, um, so is uh, how, uh, whether and how uh, uh, US, uh, Japan, Korea relations matter for China's uh, behavior in the East China Sea and South China Sea? Uh, and then uh, here is a uh, interesting question and comment uh, from uh, our uh, Tower Center uh, forum member and supporter, Ed Arnert. Uh, he first praises Mark, like it's marvelous to have professional diplomat like you, Mark. However, Trump administration has discredited our standing on the world stage. So, uh, so his question is why would Japan and Korea uh, listen to us? Uh, well, I would like to also relate this to a um, uh, question from um, uh, uh, the Savuni Desai, our, uh, my student, uh, say, uh, so if the you know, U.S. doesn't do that, <laughs> doesn't do the job of like, uh, uh, providing stability or like, trying to unify, you know, uh, encourage the cooperation between U.S. and uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, if, like, you know, as like, uh, Ed is concerned like the uh, U.S. Uh, is somehow discredited uh, by uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, who can do that job? Uh, so how like uh, Japan, South Korea uh, cooperation uh, will happen? Um, and, uh, and one more thing that I'd like to throw in, um, one more factor uh, to this uh, big question that is uh, uh, coming from uh, Bon Joon Kim, uh, my uh, student uh, who is currently taking international relations class says he raises a concern that, uh, so the, one of the reasons why you, uh, Japan South Korea relations uh, is uh, so uh, rocky is uh, a history issue. And, uh, and then uh, recently, uh, Abe administration uh, really uh, kind of changed the security policy and uh, in changed the interpretation of the constitution. And then, um, so uh, 2015 security legislation uh, and then that's all like about for, to, for the purpose of stability of uh, East Asia and the regional security. But uh, that may raise the concern, that may have raised the concern uh, from, the, from the South Korea or China uh, for kind of Japan's like remilitarization. Um, so uh, having said that, so it seems like I'm starting with the China's rights and then it changes the geopolitics uh, in the region. Uh, and then how like the U.S. Uh, is involved or should be involved uh, in the uh, regional security of the Asia Pacific and East Asia uh, in the age of Trump and in the, in the age that uh, uh, and uh, in the time when uh, Japan and South Korea may be concerned with the U.S. involvement uh, in the security of um, of the East Asia region. So uh, who wants to start with us answering these questions? Oh, um, okay, uh, I will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I will uh, just make some starting comments. Um, on the China factor, yes, yes, I, uh, this is a very important um, issue and I was na not able to address that that much. But um, number one, China is for Japan and Korea is a big, you know, neighbor. I mean, prox uh, geographically, proxim uh, proximity wise. So um, we can't just cut all relations with China as well. And we want to also um, shape, shape China so that it can uh, play a more constructive role um, for its own sake um, as well. Um, and, um, uh, for, uh, and we want, um, how do you say, in terms of like, especially the uh, con controversial issue of um, digital technology and so, so forth, um, Japan and Korea wants connectivity with security. And so sometimes we will cooperate with China and sometimes I think there will be areas where we be, will have to be more um, careful about um, who we uh, cooperate with. And so that's the kind of relationship um, I think we're gonna be um, um, looking for or looking toward. And, um, and also in terms of um, triangles, uh, there is a US ROK Japan triangle, which is important for security, economy, soft power, democracy, and all that. And, but there's also the CJK, the China, Japan, Korea um, triangle that we have been developing slowly since 1997. And um, we will have that summit. Um, we'll, we, will, we plan to have that summit again this year um, in Seoul or in Korea somewhere. So that's an area where we can um, meet, the, the three leaders can meet. And, and also there's a lot of cooperation on non-traditional security aspects like um, environment and global health and, and all that. So it's a very multifaceted relationship and, and dealing with China, working with China is one area of Japanese foreign policy and also it should be with Japan, Korea uh, relations. Um, and, uh, but on security, um, the uh, East China Sea, South China Sea, um, you know, Korea is going to be very, very um, careful about it. So, but, um, so that's that, um, whether Korea wants to join the Quad Plus or not, it's, it's, it's a whole big issue. Um, but in any case, um, there's many different facets of cooperation, not just um, security in, uh, in the uh, whole maritime sphere, which we want Korea to cooperate more, but um, there's economy, uh, the technology area, um, and you know all these areas that we need to cooperate on. So it's, you should look at it as a whole. Um, and sh should I end the uh, my comments on China there and yeah. address the question, address the other question later? I think uh, Mark has some comments yeah. on China. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. That's that was. Uh, you saved the easy question for last. Um, look, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the word uh, or the term inflection point is tossed around a lot uh, when you're talking about these big issues. Um, I've actually never known what that means. Inflection point, uh, transition, I guess, is another way to put it. But if you look at uh, sort of the post-World War II period, right after World War II, um, really it was the United States that, that took the lead in establishing the global system that we have enjoyed the past almost seven decades, whether it was the global system to deal with trade, we had the GATT, whether it was the global financial system, we had the, the IMF, uh, sort of the global uh, system for assisting developing countries with the World Bank and so on and so forth and, and everything in between. Um, really it was the United States that, that played a leading and almost sort of unitary role in establishing uh, the way that the world does did business and, and does business today. Well, that's changing. And now we, we have these new technologies emerging. We have new ways of organizing ourselves. Um, everything from again, things like autonomous vehicles, things like artificial intelligence, uh, 5G and, and everything that goes with that, the internet of things, uh, biotechnology, lots of new new efforts in every sort of field. And the key to the next 70 years, the key to the next century is going to be, what are the standards that guide these efforts? And, you know, the United States, we can't do it alone. And this is where our partners, our friends, our allies, um, like Japan, like South Korea, this is where they come in. And so is it going to be us, sort of liberal democracies that enjoy 
personal freedoms and an open economy and rule of law and transparent governance and good governance, is it going to be folks like us, Japan, South Korea, Australia, the EU, India, New Zealand, Canada, or is it going to be China that sets the standards for the next hundred years? And this really is going to be, I think, the key um, to either preserving our way of life or, or you know, trending towards uh, the way of life in, in the People's Republic of China, you know, surveillance state, facial recognition that, that watches you everywhere you go and, and sort of a social credit system that uh, if, if you get too many parking tickets, all of a sudden you can't buy a house or something like that. And so um, it's really going to be, it is our responsibility. And this isn't something um, the U.S. is imposing on South Korea or, 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 or Japan. This is something that should be organic, that, that all of our countries need to come to the same conclusion at the same time, that it's our responsibility as democracies to, to set the standards for the next hundred years because if we don't, someone else will. Thank you. Uh, we have to uh, close uh, this, this very interesting discussion. Uh, one thing that I re realized is uh, we talked a lot about uh, triangle and uh, not only uh, China, uh, sorry, not only uh, US, Japan, Korea uh, triangle, but also um, Satara-san talks about uh, Japan, uh, China, Korea uh, triangle. Uh, so, uh, so when we talk about triangle, uh, we may imagine like a very little stable like a uh, triangle with uh, equal footings. Uh, but actually in reality, it is not the case. Uh, so uh, we have to keep managing uh, the triangle, any triangle. And uh, so otherwise uh, that may be um, unraveling. Um, so, uh, but you know, as uh, uh, Mark said, uh, so we have to uh, keep managing and um, so uh, answering uh, Ed's question, um, well, uh, one way to do is we should recognize that you know, we have excellent diplomats uh, like Mark, and uh, they are the people who are really supporting that like, uh, kind of unstable uh, triangular relationship behind the scene. Um, so uh, thank you very much for all the uh, attendees, all the participants. Uh, this was very uh, interesting uh, discussion. I apologize that I was unable to take all the questions, uh, but uh, I hope that uh, uh, this was um, helpful to understand uh, the security and the economy of the Asia Pacific. So now I pass the microphone to Paul. Well, um, thank you so much, Hiroki, and thank you to all of our, our speakers for their time and their role in helping us learn more about an important topic in the US, East Asia, and around the world. We would also like to express our gratitude to everyone who attended the program and for your eagerness to better understand security and economic relations. At this time, we'll, we will talk about some upcoming events and will be coming on your screen. Wonderful. Um, we also hope that you can join for some of these upcoming programs. Next month on October 14th, we are proud to present an event on leadership with Itochu International's president and CEO, Mitsuru Claire Chino who became the first female executive of a Japanese trading company in 2013. Karen Ideno, Group Vice President at Toyota Financial Services, will serve as the moderator. Please also save the date on Thursday, October 29th, for the celebration of our 50th anniversary with appearances by actor George Takei, former U.S. Presidential Cabinet member Norman Mineta, four ambassadors, Ryozo Kato, Ichiro, Ujisaki, Kenichiro Sasai, and Thomas Schieffer, Toyota Motor North America President and CEO Tetsuo Ogawa, former Mayor of Dallas Ronald Kirk, and Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price. Among other special guests, so we will have many people to join that program to, to give remarks and, and, and be part of that event. This evening will also include a special video, musical performances, a trivia contest, and a silent auction. We kindly ask that you complete the post-event survey, which will pop up in your browser once the program ends. If you are unable to access the link, we will also share in a post-event email. This includes this evening's program, and thank you for attending. Have a wonderful rest of the evening for our U.S. attendees, and a great rest of the day for those in Japan. Thank you so much.